Hello and welcome to Create Your Light. Today with me is Aurelie from France. She is the most incredible videographer. She shoots extreme sports, which is just mind blowing. And here is Donna, who is from UK and is a specialist in food photography. Two totally different areas, but we've come together and we've just been playing around with the Z6 and Z7 twos, and we've just been having the best fun. Let us explore the coming together of our two worlds. Let's get this rolling. How yeah. do you say that in French? Ça tourne. Oh, awesome. questions I'm often asked. One, how do I get my blueberries white when they're frozen? And two, do you use focus shift shooting or focus stacking? And I'll cover the blueberries in a second, but let's get to the techie stuff. So focus shift shooting sounds super complicated, but let me tell you, it's actually the easiest thing. Basically, what you do is you go into your menu, you go into focus shift shooting, you select the number of images you want and the number of steps that you want. Don't forget to create a new folder because it's really difficult if you have a huge amount of images to work out which batch belong to which set. So what the camera essentially does is you program it, you hit start, and you focus your, actually before you hit start, you set your focal point at the front of your image. And then the camera will automatically go step by step by step all the way to the back of the image. And by doing this, it creates a number of different images that you can then take into digital editing, combine all the images together, and you end up with beautifully sharp pictures from top to bottom. People think that all you need to do is just narrow down your aperture and push it through to f16, f22, and they'll get a fully sharp image. But if you set it at f5.6, you do focus stacking, you will get a crystal clear, sharp image all the way through. So in the image that Aurelie and I took, we included some textures and some other details just so you can actually see how sharp that image is going to be because the texture is actually going to be in focus right from here all the way through to the back. Are you going to share your secret about the white blueberry? The secret to getting your blueberries white is for some reason, I'm always asked this. You need to freeze them and you need to make sure that they're really hard. So not just five minutes in the freezer, they need to be put in overnight. You can't touch them with your fingers. You have to pour them into a bowl. And then what you do is you cover your mouth, you put your mouth over it and you blow. I call it dragon breath. You've got to really blow hard onto it. And that instantly makes it white and just really looks like it's frozen and hard. Hey, thanks for the tip. Yeah, it's a pleasure. I'm always asked on Instagram how you do it. So I thought I'd share it with you. So Aurelie, I saw that you stole the camera before me and you were playing around with it. What were you doing? I, I couldn't resist the pleasure of using this 105 macro lens, which is super beautiful with an aperture of 2.8. And so you can uh, imagine some new kind of images because you show what you cannot see with your eyes because it's macro. So your eyes just cannot see all those details. And so you see like the, the frost coming and the blueberries and it creates something that like you wonder first what you're looking at, but then it creates something quite epic, I would say. And uh, at this precision, it's super hard, you know, not to move. So first I was like using the tripod and then I tried to be super smooth to see like the light changing at the blueberries. And I had like so much pleasure using that lens. It's beautiful. It's really a great lens. So maybe that would be my last tip is when you shoot, you want the shots to look very different. So don't be scared of being extreme, extremely wide and extremely narrow. And both of them are super fun to do.
comes to food photography and still life photography, your light is super, super important. Generally, as photographers, we try and get as much light into our images as possible, but when it comes to food, we want to use directional light. What is directional light? It comes from one direction. We have a light source coming from one direction. We'll have a highlight hitting our, our subject. It'll cross over to some, to some shadows, and that gives a beautiful depth and dimension. And I would say it's the same for a video because it's a, it's a light that creates an image. So whatever you're going to have as a subject, you, we, you will have to pay attention to the light which is highlighting it. And here we have the chance to have this big opening space, which could be a window in uh, any kind of house. And because it, it's pretty big and because it's very soft light, it's going to make a, a soft shadow yeah. on the subject, which is, I think, what you want for that, that is, kind of image. That is really important. Your type of shadow is absolutely crucial. You don't want a very harsh light that's going to create a hard shadow because that's just very, that, that's very overpowering in a still life or food, in a food shot. You just really just want a nice little feathered shadow that you can see that just slowly disappears into the background. And again, when it comes to your directional light, you want to see your highlights hitting the side, your mid-tones, and then your shadows into your shadow on the bottom. And that way, it also shows the texture around the front of your, what your subject is placed on. It's really, really important because you want your subject to be grounded. You want your subject to look like it's actually on the ground and not floating or just being put there later in post-production. So your shadows are really important, showing your texture is really important, and showing dimension is really important. So when you're about to take a picture or a video, it's the same like uh, process about something, don't hesitate to turn around. Yep. Because so you have the different angles and you see how the light is reacting on your subject. Yep. So it's very interesting just to turn around and maybe take some pics from each side to see what kind of light you prefer. Absolutely. And yeah, I mean, and, and the best tip I can give you is take an egg, walk around the house and find a window and turn it in different directions and see how the light casts across your egg. I, send, I tell this all the time to my students. This is, I call it the egg test. Just walk around with an egg. Your family will think you're crazy, but you know what? It doesn't matter. At, at the end of the day, <laughs> finding that perfect light is absolutely key. And when you have found the, the place where you want like, to, to do your, what is going to be your set, then turning around, then you will decide which will be your angle. And I would say if you make videos, it's not going to be about only one angle because the storytelling needs different yeah. shots to to put together and create a story. So maybe you will take one shot from here, one shot from there. And personally, I really, I'm a big fan of the backlight. So I know that I will also take some shot from here. So I will have all the light coming from the side and highlighting the edge of, of yeah. the egg and like showing the relief on this, uh, the three dimension of the plate. So it's gonna like have- Really bring it out. And talking about backlighting, backlighting is also great for food photography if you're all, particularly with drinks. If you've got a beautiful drink, you can imagine a glass of champagne. Oh, yeah. Backlit with bubbles coming up, that's just the best way to photograph a, a nice clear drink with some, some, something in it, you know, like a little bit of bubbles. Yeah, and to show the sparkle. transparency. Yeah, to show the transparency yeah. is a great way to show it. And even if you have a flat subject that maybe has some oil on it or a little bit of a shine, that's a really great way to make that shine stand out. So it's essential to, to try your subject from different positions. I mean, that's, that's the bottom line here, is we're gonna take your subject, position it in different ways, and look at how the light falls across it. You now know what you're looking for. You're looking for highlights, tonal variation, and shadows. So we've just taken three different, sh uh, three different shots. We've got a front light, a side light, and a back light. So you can see from the three images that we've taken, the first one from the front is very flat and two-dimensional. When we move to the second one, you can see where the tonal variation comes in and it really makes that, that dimension pop out and really makes it stand out. And then when, you, when we move to the backlighting to the third image, you can see that there's a, there's a higher tip of um, highlights and then a lot more shadows. So it really just depends on the subject that you're shooting.
section, we're going to talk about three things. We're going to talk about the camera, the lighting, and the subject. So just to run you through my, my setup, I'm using the 105 mirrorless macro lens, and it's an f2.8. I have a setup on my tripod, and my camera is set to manual. In case you're wondering what this is, this is actually a spirit level, which I've connected into the hot shoe of my camera. And that just allows me to align the camera perfectly to make sure that it's horizontal and vertically correct. And I can constantly see it all the time while I'm setting up in case the camera gets moved or the tripod gets moved in any way. I have set up my camera in an overhead position. Now, I know that I mentioned that this is a macro, a macro lens, but you can use it as a regular lens and, and photograph from further back, which is what I've done with this image. By the way, my camera settings, my camera is set to manual. I have taken the picture at um, f5.6. It's great to take an overhead picture from f5.6 anywhere up from there because you really want uh, focus and detail. My ISO is set to 100 and it, my shutter speed is at 1 20th of a second. Because my shutter speed is at 1 20th of a second, it's absolutely essential to make sure that you put your camera onto a tripod and you can set the timer so that you can take the image, step away, and the camera will take the, 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 the image without bumping the shutter release button by mistake or anything. As much as the 105 has stabilization in the lens, it's always good to be really careful when taking images at a slow shutter speed, just so that you don't get some camera shake or blur. Right, so let's talk about the lights, because this is, as I've said, this is a really essential part to your photography. So as I mentioned earlier, we have the light coming in from one direction. We've got the light coming from the side. And even though this is set up on the floor, you still apply the same principles because you still want a, dominant, a prominent shadow. You don't want to hide any shadows, which can happen if you're shooting from an overhead. So just make sure that you apply the same principles in terms of your lighting. So looking at the image, you can definitely see the, the shadows coming in. And even underneath the beams, there's still a hint of shadows. Um, particularly around the edge of the tray, that's where, I, that's where it shows that there's still some height coming from the edge of the tray and the lip. So here's a tip. Take your time. Use your touch screen. Tilt your screen so that you can see your image clearly. And you can even use SnapBridge. Don't worry, we will get to that at a later stage. But it's really important to make sure that you set your camera correctly. You make sure your exposure is at the right settings so that you can see your highlights and you can see your shadows. Moving on to the third and final part, which is our subject. And that's actually really important as well. Just playing around with beans, it's a simple subject, but they're long and slim. So try and keep them natural looking as possible. Don't try and get overstressed about how you're going to position them, but allow some space to breathe within your image as well. You can see we have empty space to the left, and we've just opened up a few pods, shown off the inside of the bean, and just allowed a couple of empty spaces in the middle as well. This is called negative space, and it's a really great way to allow your subject to breathe and your viewer to feel that there's, there's space around it. And then finally, I brought in a little bit of nature by sprinkling a bit of sand around it, because at the end of the day, it's great just to add that connection of nature to your food. So now that you've seen the still side of it, I'm so intrigued to see what Aurelie has done with, this, with the video side. So now let's talk about video, which means animated images, which is very different to still photography, and which is quite a challenge to make video of something that doesn't move at all. Because, so basically, there will be no movement unless you create the movement yourself. So that's how we, what we're gonna do now. And for me, it's really being out of my comfort zone because usually, what I'm filming is moving a lot in a very big environment, which are the mountains, opposite to a very small set of anonymous things.
So don't worry, even if this doesn't move, we can make a dynamic video with a lot of rhythm in it because the graphics are great, the textures, the colors. So there's a lot to do with just like beans on the floor and the set because the way she put the beans creates some energy in the image. So now I'm gonna try to put this energy in the video I'm gonna shoot. So there are different ways to create rhythm and movement in your video. So you can have very like still shots, kind of photography shots. But if you add a lot of them with different angles and different views, together they create a rhythm. That's not really movement, but it's a way of having a dynamic video. Otherwise, you can create the movement inside your camera, so you can have something moving, like someone or an action, which is not the case here. So now we have only two ways of creating movement. One is to move our camera, so we'll see that later. And the other one is to move the things inside the camera to create the movement by changing some settings while you record. So for that, the main one could be doing the focus. And I started my career as a focus puller in fiction movie, which is actually a job. All you do during your day is making sure that the actor is in focus wherever he is on the set. So that's something I'm going to use now on these beans to create some uh, dynamism, to create some movement just by changing the focus inside my camera. So if you want to play with the focus, you have to have a difference of distance between the camera and the subject. Here, if I shoot this way, I will have the benefit of the nice composition, but I cannot play with the focus because all the beans are the same distance to my camera. So it will just be the same. And uh, playing with it will just say, I'm out of focus and then I'm in focus, but everything will be the same, so it's not very interesting. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go lower and here, I can have the depth between, the difference of depth between the first one and the further one. So I will have to adjust the focus because it will not all be unfocused in my image. So that's what gives me the opportunity to play with the focus in an image like that and create a kind of movement. I love that you can create movement from something that's just still life. The lens I have here is a kind of lens that I would use in a mountain shooting because with one lens I can cover different views. So I don't have to always change my lens when you are like in the snow or in the dust when you have to be careful to use sensor. So that's a very useful lens. So here all I have to do now is to turn on my camera, put it on a video mode, and then I will just turn the focus on the lens while I'm filming, and it will change the distance, and it will create the movement of the focus going from the first yeah. bin to the last one. I love that. I love that you can actually turn an inanimate object into something that's moving. And it's, it's so, so easy. It's just like about playing on just the lens, playing with, your lens. with the focus. And I can also play on the screen. And because yeah. the screen is like, I can adjust it so I can see properly. And then I just press on the screen where I want the focus to be, and the focus will follow. So it's, it's even more smooth when the computer is doing it than when I'm doing it myself by turning the lens because I can go a bit too far or maybe too close and completely lose the focus, which is never what I want. But pressing the buttons here, it's not the buttons, the pressing in the image, the zone that I want on focus, it's so easy. And it's the uh, it's easiest way to create movement in such a still image. One of the things I'm often asked about when I'm shooting in, the, in my studio on my own 
is how do I manage to get myself into the pictures or how to do a pouring shot or a motion shot. So a lot of photographers will use a remote and that's great just for one image, but if you wanna capture a really good motion shot, you need a series of images to just, just choose the ideal one out of all of them. And often I need to use both of my hands or I want them both in the image at the same time, which means I can't be standing using a hand remote at the same time. So here's the trick. What other photographers would use for time lapses, I use to capture these motion shots and that's using interval timer shooter. And it's so simple. You literally go into the menu, find interval timer shooting, and I set mine to 0.5 seconds between each image. And then I'll set it to take a series of between 10 to 20 images, all in the same timer setting. The cool thing about interval is that you can choose to set it the way you want to do it. You can change your timer setting, your number of images, or the intervals between those images. So depending on what you're shooting, you can adapt your interval to how you want it to be. You can change the intervals between the, between the images, or you can make more images, as, as many as you want. It's easier if you don't use it on silent photography, because then you can actually hear the images clicking as they're being taken. So you know how many are being taken, when you're at the end of the series, and when you're beginning the series. So we've had so much fun playing around today with icing. I promise you, we've had icing sugar everywhere. But let's just talk about the settings that we did. So we had it on a, on, we had it on a static f2.8 throughout the shoot. We played around with the shutter speed so we could have a fast shutter speed in some shots and a slower in others, just to see the different effects and what would happen with them. We also ensured we played around with the background and by ensuring that you have a darker background, that shows contrast against what you're actually sprinkling, against the white icing sugar. And in general, I think the images turned out great. It was a lot of fun, loads of icing, and yeah, worthwhile trying and playing around with. But I gotta tell you, Aurelie did some crazy stuff, which I'm dying to see. Not because of all the sugar she's been spreading at the biscuits, <laughs> like having fun, like playing with sugar. For me, it creates a movement in my image. So I have to take the opportunity of this sugar entering the frame to have some, uh, some motion, some natural motion that makes sense in my video. So for that, I will, I'm going to play with the settings that I have in this camera that allow me to do slow motion. So slow motion is just like, instead of playing natural speed, you're gonna slow down the movement to like highlight it and it creates a kind of poetry, I want to say. It does. Yeah, because yeah. it works on so many things. Like if you film someone and you film here as a person in slow motion, it looks like more poetic, more Romantic, dramatic. Yeah. dramatic, beautiful, yeah. Yeah, people look better yeah. actually. And for me, as I'm filming action sports, it's fantastic to slow down an action so you can see all the details of a backflip or whatever is happening. And even here on a scene like that, using the slow motion will give us the feeling of the sugar falling on the biscuits. Snowy, so, snowy feeling. Exactly. And it's what we want. As you say, like snow, snowflakes just like falling down in the image. So, but for this, I have to change a few settings in my camera, which is super easy because I access them with the I button menu. Now in the video settings, I have the choice between two very important, two major parameters. One is the size of my image and one is the frame rate. Usually I would choose the highest resolution because then I have the biggest image and I can crop it. For example, if I want a vertical video for social media, which I watch on a smartphone, which is mostly vertical. But in this case, maybe I will lower down a bit my resolution to still keep a good one, which is HD video, which is a standard for television, but that will allow me to increase my frame rate 
and so to increase the uh, possibilities of doing slow motion in post-production. The, the standard frame rate would be 25 or 30 images per second, but if I double it, I can do slow motion, which will be twice slower. And if I go even higher, which would be 100 and 120 frames per second, I can have a four times slow motion, which, is, which will give us even more details on the snowflakes falling down on the biscuits. So this is actually what I just did to have the best image with the highest slow motion option on this video. And there are two other settings that we have to talk about, and it's about the color of the image. Color and texture, but mainly color. Because in a still image, you take one image. In a video, you have to take several. So when I turn around the subject, the color change because the light change. And when it's automatic, it will just like recreate the white in the best way. But maybe it's not going to be exactly the same look between the different angles. Let's look at these three shots that I took with the automatic white balance. All of them are correct, but what you see is that they don't fit together because the colors are different, because the light is different. So in video, we want to fix the settings. So th for this reason, I'm going to go again in the eye menu and I'm going to change the white balance in the settings. So instead of choosing an automatic white balance, I would just choose any other one. So talking about colors, we can also adjust the picture control of our image. So I shoot in RAW. Are you not shooting in RAW? Well, I could, but I prefer to work with the uh, intern card. So no, I'm not shooting RAW. So I think it's quite cool because I'm taking one image and that's creating art, so to speak. Oh, of course. But you are doing so many different things. You, you're positioning yourself in different angles and you're slowing your camera down and you're speeding it up. I think that's awesome. I well, think it's amazing. Yeah. So, so storytelling in video is very different to what you would have in a picture because a picture has to tell the story itself. Mm -hmm. Like it's one picture yep. for the entire story. You have to capture it in one image, in right. one shot. Exactly. Now with social media, we tend to can have one file, one video, which is just like a story itself, but it's very rare. But what is so great about all of this is that we can do an image and we can do video and we can just do it all with our cameras. Exactly. And I want to talk about two things. I want to discuss snap ridge and I want to discuss shape and color. Well, actually it's three, but we'll, we'll put it together on one, in, in one talk. So when I'm styling a flat lay scene, there's a lot of standing up and bending down all the time. And I know that it could be a good gym workout, but when it's all day long, it can get really tiring. So for me, I switch on my snap ridge onto my mobile device and I can literally just stay in one position and arrange and style everything, seeing exactly what is happening on my device. I'd rather actually go to the gym to do a full workout. This is just so much easier, quick, and I can just move things around and see what's happening. I can also change my camera settings and I can release the shutter. Having access to live view has really made a big difference with my photography and has managed to save me a huge amount of time when I'm shooting in the studio. The other thing I want to talk about is color and shapes. So being in such an incredible environment and having access to one of the most beautiful markets I've ever seen, I couldn't resist buying some of this gorgeous uh, citrus fruit. And at the same time, I managed to find some local tiles, which just are so beautiful and complement the colors of the citrus. But with the citrus being, there are quite a lot of large pieces and there's a lot of smaller pieces, which is really great because it adds beautiful balance but try cutting them. Some of them need to be cut in half, some of them need to be cut in quarters, and position them around in a C circle so you have a little bit of negative space still staying in the middle, but the eye can travel from the shopping bag all the way through to the chopping board. It tells a great story. So what we learned from this example is that complementary colors look really, really great together. 
We've learned that storytelling is essential, particularly if you're showing where you are and the environment that you're working in. And then don't be afraid to change shapes and dimensions because it just adds a little bit extra to your final image. And finally, I've got to talk about my Z7 II. The resolution on this camera is absolutely incredible. If I zoom into the citrus, you can literally see every little bit of detail and every little drop of juice in it. So now we're gonna head over to Aurelie because let me tell you, she did some absolute magic with her videos today. So here we have another situation in which the subject doesn't move at all. So I will have to create the dynamic on my video. For this, I have two options. The first one is to multiple the angles and the shots. And then it's at the editing moment that I will have a, a dynamic edit with all these different angles. And I can like play music and have these different views on my scene. And that's going to be quite dynamic. But I can also use the stabilization, which I have in my camera, to try to make some moves myself. So I will do some small travelings as the camera itself will move. And using the stabilization inside, it will look smooth. And I will also help it myself because I'm not going to shoot it like shaking, like if I would do it naturally. So what I'm doing to lower down my own moves as much as I can is that I'm holding my camera close to my body and my upper body doesn't move at all. I just adjust my balance from one leg to another. And that's how I create the move with having my camera as smooth as possible, always at the same elevation. So then I have only a little bit of shaking that I cannot avoid because I'm a human, but the camera will compensate it with a stabilization system and it will make smooth movements. So using the stabilization, using the viewfinder, using the screen, it allows me to do a big variety of shots and it's this combination that will make my video exciting to watch. Hey Aurelie, I have to tell you, I think it's so impressive that you didn't need all this fancy equipment and that you could just turn your body into a gimbal. <laughs> and I'm impressed with all the composition that you're doing in the shot. Thank you, you created. it. Thank you so much. You've just seen the biggest crash of creativity coming together from videography to stills in one hit. Yeah, I don't think our worlds could be more different than they are, but like with these great tools that we have, these sets of mirrorless cameras, we can explore any kind of video. Absolutely. If you want to see more Create Your Light tutorials, go online and have a look. They seriously are worth having a look at. Thank you so much, Aurelie, for joining me today. It was so much fun learning about videography. It's an essential part of food photography that I really wanted to get involved with. So I just really appreciate you showing me your knowledge. And thank you for showing me your tips, your secrets, and uh, introducing me into your world. Oh, thank you. And thank you, everybody, for joining us. Please go out, create beautiful images, and remember to hashtag create your light. Au revoir. That's not